Hello once again, I'm Extra Life, and you are looking at the latest thing, the pinnacle, the bleeding edge in switch matrix technology. Made with revolutionary perf board construction, it combines two excellent high-tech ideas, multiplexing and matrix wiring. Let's check it out. This incredible device contains 16 LEDs, 16 switches, matrix wiring connecting all of them together, and an input-output expander to connect it to our main board. It's going to let us make our sequencer actually play a sequence. And to learn more about it, let's rewind a little bit and see how it was constructed. Although this device seems a little complicated, it's actually pretty simple in operation. All of the positive legs of the LEDs are connected by row, and all of the negative legs are connected by column. So if we apply power to one of the rows, we can choose which of the columns lights up. By moving where we apply the power, we change which of the rows gets turned on. And by using the same cycling trick, going very quickly from row to row, we can create the illusion that they're all on at the same time while still maintaining individual control of each LED. These push-button switches, or tacked switches, are wired in exactly the same way, but of course we can't see them light up, so let's put together a quick circuit to demo that. So now this column of LEDs is connected to this column of buttons, and if we push the buttons, we can see each LED light up. So we have individual control over each column at a time, and this allows us to do what's called matrix scanning. So by scanning through each of the columns and each of the rows, we can see if any of the buttons are being pushed and turn on the corresponding LED. The advantage of using matrix wiring to put these components together is that it really cuts down on the number of connections we have to make to our microcontroller. By using the multiplication of the matrix wiring, we're able to use 4 times 4 gets us 16 LEDs, and 4 times 4 more gets us 16 switches. And we can make all 16 of those connections, 8 on each side, on this input-output expander. So, without making any additional connections to our microcontroller, we're able to add 32 devices and interface with all of them individually. Another advantage of this technique is that we cut down on the total number of parts needed. So, for 16 LEDs, we might think we would need 16 resistors. But, because only one row is on at a time, we actually only need four resistors to do the whole thing. Not coincidentally, this exact same matrix wiring technique is what's used in a whole number of devices. Particularly, anything with a grid of LEDs or buttons on it, as well as MIDI keyboards and computer keyboards. 
Also, but not quite as commonly, this technique can be applied to devices with large numbers of potentiometers, where you need to read in analog values. And not all input-output expanders are capable of returning analog values, so it's a little bit more difficult to implement. But if you have a device that has lots of knobs on it, then it may be worthwhile to scan through them with a matrix grid. Now that we know this hardware works, let's take the next step and try and control this matrix from software using the Arduino and our I.O. expander chip. Let's upload this new sketch to the Arduino and see if we can count across all the LEDs on the protoboard. Awesome! Now we have access to each of the individual LEDs through the software and the outputs on our I.O. expander. However, in order to light up multiple rows at the same time, we'll need to take advantage of that same multiplexing trick we did before. Now we're looping through each of the rows of the LEDs and the speed at which we iterate them once again, we have controlled by a potentiometer going to one of the analog inputs of the Arduino. So let's turn up the speed and see what happens. Now we're multiplexing this display and we can turn up the rate uh, until we get it to a speed where we no longer see any of the rows being off. They're just all on at the same time. Now I'm going to try and program a really simple sequencer that's just on and off when one of these LEDs is illuminated or not. Wicked. Now we're counting from 1 to 16, and we can use the buttons to toggle off and on any of the steps in the sequence. Using these I.O. expanders as inputs is a little bit different from using them as outputs, because input pins can't just be left disconnected or floating in electronics parlance. This is because if they're not connected to anything with a load on it, they'll randomly report off, then on, then off, then on, depending on where the static electricity buildup in that pin sits in relation to the ground of the circuit. So you have to use a pull-up or pull-down resistor. You can do that using a pull-up resistor that you install externally, connect it to a pin and to ground, and then apply a voltage to the pin to pull it up when you want to turn it on. However, this chip, the MCP23S17, has internal pull-up resistors, so we can leave the pins floating in pull-up mode and then connect them to ground through the button when we want to toggle them. For more detail on that, you can read the code that I've posted on GitHub describing how to use this I.O. expander as an input and output simultaneously. Now let's connect the matrix circuit board to the Arduino and the display and the analog output chip that we have on the breadboard. With this jumbled mess of wires, we now have all the components finally put together, multiplexing one another, displaying values, reading them from an analog source, and then outputting them to an analog output. So we have all the elements we need to build a functional sequencer. Using these switches, we can control which steps are on and off, and using our potentiometer, we can control the pitch of each of those steps. So let's program that and hook it up to our sequencer to see what it sounds like. All right, now I've got our sequencer wired up to the synth. Let's plug it in and see what kind of sounds we can make.
Well, that's progress of a kind. It connects to our synthesizer, and it plays a sequence. We can even control that sequence with the hardware that we've got here. But this setup is pretty fiddly. Sometimes if you look at it the wrong way, or push a button too hard, it stops making sound, or the lights stop blinking. This is to be expected with the kind of materials we're using, protoboard and breadboard. They're not very stable because they're not meant to be permanent. But now that we've worked out some of the kinks and squashed some bugs, our next step ought to be to think about making a more permanent prototype. So we'll finalize our schematic and think about making our very first printed circuit board. See you then! Thank mm -hmm. you.